today we have Ben Westerfeld, with a Dutch last name, <laughs> um, and he uh, is finishing his PhD at Princeton. Postdoc, sorry, sorry. At Princeton and is visiting, uh, I guess, and he will be talking about aerosols and plant. Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I'm guessing not many people know me, so uh, like Bastian said, I'm finishing postdoc uh, at, at Princeton, working with uh, Denise Masrol in the Woodrow Wilson Department, and uh, a couple of GFTL scientists, Larry Horowitz and Michelle Um So I'm not exactly sure what my role here is, kind of just visiting. There's some uh, proposals in the mix, maybe to end up working here. Um, soon, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. But as for now, I'm just presenting work from uh, what I've done at Princeton and GFDL. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about uh, radio forcing and climate response to projected 21st century aerosol decreases. So just a brief reminder about the effects of aerosols on climate. Uh, so we have the direct effects, the indirect effects, and then what I'm going to call other effects. Uh, direct effects, just referring to interactions with um, coming solar radiation, so scattering and absorption. Indirect effects uh, has to do with modifying cloud properties and then other effects. Um, it's not, I don't want to be fully exhaustive here, but things like the effects of uh, aerosols on atmospheric dynamics and circulation and feedbacks that that can have on, on climate. Uh, and so this little cartoon here is sort of to show the aerosol indirect effect in more detail. So you can imagine um, a more clean air mass on the left uh, with kind of sort of less anthropogenic aerosols and then a more polluted air mass on the right. Uh, I guess all these dots here are making it <laughs> a little more confusing on the screen. Uh, but it, sort of the black dots are just projector error. Um, but anyway. <laughs> so with the more polluted air mass, you have more aerosols, higher CCN concentration, which is going to lead to um, higher cloud droplet numbers as well. And for a fixed amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, this will also mean that the water is spread more thinly across a larger population of particles, and so you can have smaller as well as more abundant there's, uh, cloud droplets. And so this leads to um, a higher surface area, or a brighter, a brighter uh, cloud or a higher albedo, uh, which is sort of the cloud albedo effect. And then the other effect, um, much more uncertain, um, but there's some uh, reasons to believe that these uh, smaller particles might cause more, or sorry, less precipitation and lead to a longer uh, cloud lifetime. Um, but again, that's sort of still not uh, entirely figured out. And then the other big, or one of the other big impacts of aerosols or why we care is the effect on health. And so this is a figure from the World Health Organization. Uh, by the way, it make pretty crappy figures. Like this is some ex default Excel figure, and it looks horrible. But it's the World Health Organization for you. Um, but anyway, the point is that the uh, in, in 2012, air pollution killed seven million people um, globally. Uh, a lot of them come, came in um, India, China, East and South Asia in general. Um, more than half were from outdoor air pollution, and about the other, the rest of them were sort of from indoor and things like that. Um, so given this sort of human health impact, uh, it's going to be expected that there's going to be more air pollution control in the future, um, for a good reason. We don't want to have people dying so much. Uh, and so what I'm plotting here is the global aerosol and aerosol precursor emissions uh, from 1860 to 2100. Uh, so we have sulfur dioxide, black carbon, and organic carbon. And you can see, well, first of all, I guess that the pink line is the historical trend, and then the different colored lines past about the year 2000 are the RCPs, the representative concentration pathways. Probably everyone knows sort of what those are, but they're just sort of um, inventories or, or pathways, projections for um, <laughs> short-lived and long-lived climate forcers. But you can see that, especially for SO2 and black carbon, uh, everything is sort of on the decline uh, in the aerosol world. Uh, because of this sort of expectation of more controls on power plants and stuff like that to reduce the PM 2.5 effect on health. Uh, and so a couple of, there's been a few papers on this, but one I think quite nicely called this 
uh, or yeah, maybe maybe uh, not entirely sure if this is true yet, but they sort of called it the end of the age of aerosols uh, because well, they're sort of going away. At least the anthropogenic ones are on the decline, and uh, and that's so that's going to have um, some impacts that I'd like to discuss. So that brings me to sort of what the key questions are I'm going to talk about today. And so given this um, reduction in 21st century anthropogenic aerosol emissions, I want to look at what are the resulting global and regional changes in aerosol abundance, uh, aerosol rate enforcing, and climate response. So um, I guess this is sort of you know pretty, pretty well understood now that aerosols have a net cooling effect on climate. And so you can imagine their removal is going to have a warming effect. Um, and so essentially kind of what I want to do is quantify that, quantify some other factors uh, that some other climate parameters and how those are affected by the aerosol decreases. And also kind of look at um, some regional aspects, which brings me to sort of the next question is, um, how much does the climate response to aerosol decreases matter in the context of the total climate response? So basically, kind of, how much does, say, the warming from decreases in SO2 compare to the warming from CO2 and greenhouse gases? And so, you know, obviously, CO2 and greenhouse gas warming is going to be more important. But I think will be, I think it's not very well appreciated how much this decline of, of cooling from the aerosols will contribute to uh, climate. So I'll just, I hope to improve that later by the end of this talk. And then also sort of uh, some implications for future climate and, and public policy um, based on these findings. So I'm using the GFDL climate model, uh, climate model CM3, sort of schematic shown here. It's got, um, it's a co fully coupled chemistry climate model with the land model, uh, ocean model, atmospheric model. Um, uh, you know, people are probably familiar with climate models in this group, so I won't spend a ton of time. Um, but some new, relatively new features in this latest iteration. So this is the, the version that was in the CMIP and the IPCC AR5. Uh, so relatively new, I guess. Um, but before, so now basically this version has online and interactive emissions and chemistry, whereas before aerosols especially were just prescribed. Um, they didn't interact online with emissions. Also, there was no aerosol cloud interactions in, in sort of previous iterations. So now we, we do have that. Um, and then also the, the, radi the aerosol radiation code, or the aerosol radiation modules were sort of updated to um, reflect some recent knowledge about the internal mixing of uh, sulfate and black carbon. Dan, yeah. you have an atmospheric chemistry for 86 kilometers? Uh, no, I don't think so, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, the other part of this I already mentioned briefly with the RCPs, Representative Concentration Pathways. Uh, these are also featured in the IPCC report. Uh, so there are emissions and sometimes concentration pathways for all short and long-lived climate forcers. Uh, they're called, look, they were sort of different in that they were initialized by radiative forcing endpoints. So basically that's where these numbers come from, so RCP 8.5 is at 2100, the radiative forcing is going to be 8.5 uh, watts per square meter. And then the same for the rest of these down here, 6, 4.5, and 2.6. Um, and sort of the, I guess the, the path between, the pathways here are not necessarily uh, unique. Um, that they sort of use their best representative pathways based on literature and modeling to sort of fit, uh, select sort of uh, reasonable uh, trends, which is, so it's kind of like a working backwards method as opposed to some previous and some other types of scenarios. Um, it does include both climate and air quality policy, uh, so sort of the emission factors and things like that are sensitive to uh, changes in, uh, basically for air quality policy, changes in wealth or GDP lead to uh, a reduction in emissions. Just just a basic assumption that as countries become more wealthy, uh, they're more able and more accepting to environmental regulations. 
Uh, and then it's worth noting that the current trajectory, at least based on CO2 emissions, is at or above our CP8.5. Uh, so we're currently we're currently doing it pretty badly, I guess. That's not surprising to anybody, I'm sure. <coughs> okay, so getting to how I carried out these simulations and how I answered this question of what is the effect of the aerosol-driven uh, reductions on climate. And so we first we have the the 1860 to 2005 historical runs. These are the same as the cement runs, um, three ensemble members. And then the runs that I actually did were uh, the, two, the 21st century ones, where we have a set of three numbers in which um, the RCPs are, the, the emissions are as they are prescribed in the RCPs, and basically they're all going down, kind of like I showed in that one of those first few plots. Um, so we did that for all the different RCPs. And then the next set of simulations um, the, the next three members, I'm calling them RCP underscore F, um, because they're the same except that the anthropogenic and biomass burning aerosol emissions and aerosol precursor emissions are fixed at 2005 levels throughout the entire run. So this is just um, sort of control, I guess, against the decreasing aerosols in the previous uh, runs that I described. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, taking the simple difference between this sort of transient RCP decreasing runs and fixed emissions runs allows for the isolation of the aerosol driven climate impact. Um, yeah, so that's how we get the. Um, all right, so looking at uh, global AOD first. So here I have, uh, again, trends from 1850 to 2100 in aerosolical depth for sulfate, black carbon, organic carbon, and uh, the sum of the previous three. And Again, the pink is the historical, and then the different colors uh, represent the RCPs. The solid lines are the regular RCP decreasing emissions, um, and then the dashed lines are the fixed emission runs. And so, well, I guess one thing right away is that uh, the AODs pretty much all decrease. Not surprising. We already saw the emissions. The emissions in the AOD correlate really well. Um, so yeah, nothing too shocking there. Um, Another thing that's kind of worth pointing out is that, so if you look at sort of the fixed runs, you'll notice they're all increasing for the most part. Uh, some of them are sort of flat, but so for sulfate, black carbon, and just looking at the total, they're, they're kind of going up a little. And so what's going on there, it's basically, uh, well, emissions aren't changing, so it's driven by climate changes that's causing this increase in aerosol quantity, or, or AOD in this case. Uh, things like changes in precipitation, um, changes in ventilation, wind, wind speed, changes in uh, boundary layer mixing height, um, temperature, of course, too. Uh, so it, with these simulations, we were sort of able to quantify that. Um, and that's sort of a sort of an aside that we'll talk about in a minute. It's just the effect of climate on aerosols, which is uh, currently another area of top of interest that is not really well that really well known. Different models are getting different answers. And and stuff like that. Um, but if you look at the emissions decreases, they're much larger than the climate-driven changes. So uh, just to keep in mind that sort of the emissions are really the driving factor here. It's the climate, um, the climate impact on the AOD is sort of not that as important. All right, so just as a brief aside, as I mentioned, um, looking at surface PM 2.5 and a change in climate, so not AOD anymore, um, just aerosol PM 2.5. Um, again, these are just using those fixed emissions runs, so no, emissions aren't changing in these plots, just climate. And so you can see that for sulfate, um, you know, depending on which scenario, which climate scenario you use, you can get a different answer in terms of the sign of what climate effect has on PM 2.5. So for RCP 8.5, which is the business as usual, sort of crazy emissions, burn everything, um, you get sort of an increase in, uh, in PM 2.5, pretty small one. These are global averages, by the way. Um, so it's pretty modest. And then almost the opposite is true for the lowest climate scenario, kind of the super mitigation one. Um, and so yeah, I guess the point there is that uh, the global effect on climate, uh, of climate on PM 2.5 is small, uh, according to our model, and probably
probably pretty uncertain also. Um, and it can be an increase or decrease depending on the scenario, depending on uh, the species you're looking at, and also depending on the model too, which I haven't shown here, but other models sort of give different results as well. Um, <coughs> this is a similar plot, but just looking at the end of century to beginning of century difference in PM 2.5. Uh, spatially, so kind of like the this would be the last line, I guess, of those previous plots, differenced against the first the first uh, year. Um, and I've gone to the different seasons as well, and the annual at the bottom. Uh, and so, yeah, as you can see, there's it's sort of noisy. There's areas of increase and areas of decrease. This is just for RCP 8.5, which is sort of the uh, one I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk as well. Uh, but certain, you know, certain areas like. Uh, over, especially over um, East Asia and North America, you can get upwards of a microgram per meter cubed, but overall um, it seems to be a pretty small impact, at least when you sort of look at it globally and seasonally. Yeah, the changing climate, in a warming climate, you expect yeah. precipitation to increase, right? Yes. So intuitively you would expect Amazon to go down. Yes. So yeah, I mean, if precipitation was the only factor, then yeah, well, it's a major factor. If right. the emissions are constant, then 80% um, of the lifetime is precipitation. Yeah, but I mean, so I think another, uh, I think a less appreciated factor though is probably just, um, well, first of all, temperature can have a big impact on stuff like reaction rates, reaction of SO2 to form sulfate, that way, which and the reaction is uh, temperature dependent. Um, but also things like uh, boundary layer height. Uh, you know, I'm not off the top of my head, I'm not sure how that changes in the future, but um, that can have a pretty big impact on uh, surface PM 2.5. And there's been some studies in Harvard, the Harvard group, that, in like just Chen and stuff that have, that have looked at that. And they've identified stuff like uh, stability and um, also stability and uh, ventilation to like wind speed as being important factors. Then also with precipitation, the distribution might be <coughs> different. You know, like in general, yeah, precipitation might increase, but in certain areas you can get decreases, which would lead to, you know, it lead to so it's it's not always just about it's all it's also about the distribution of the precipitation, not just kind of the total average thing. <coughs> okay, so that was just a sort of an aside. Going back to the decreases, um, so these are global aerosol optical depth decreases. This is the difference between the um, AOD, or sorry, the difference between the RCP sort of transient runs and the RCP fixed emissions runs. And so that's why all these are getting more negative. Um, this is, you know, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because it's pretty similar to what I've already shown. Um, but again, the, simil the decreases in each RCP are pretty similar. Um, there's some mid century variation if you look at like sulfate or, or the total. Um, so RCP6 in the black has this feature in its energy emissions where there's uh, an increase in the amount of coal use mid-century for whatever reason they, they projected that uh, coal, the use of coal will increase at a faster rate than it did in the first half, in the first 20 years of the century. So that's where you get that sort of slight increase in, in sulfate AOD and also sort of leveling out. And then on the other, sort of the other side of things, the RCP 2.6 features um, SO2, or sorry, it features coal emissions pretty much disappearing by the year 2050 or so, um, except for uh, coal and CCS. And so the, the, this, the disappearance, I guess, of coal as an energy supply sort of really brings down the um, sulfate AOD. Okay, looking at sort of the spatial distribution, so this is the end of century um, difference between the AOD as they're decreasing and the fixed emissions AOD. And so on the left I have RCP 2.6, on the right I have RCP 8.5. Um, and so first of all, as you would expect, there's widespread AOD reductions over Europe, um, Southeast Asia, North America, you know, especially for RCP 2.6. There, one thing that's sort of interesting is if you look at RCP 8.5, um, there's a couple of areas where they're actually projecting an increase in AOD in the future, despite kind of all I've been talking about so far is decreases. Uh, 
So in some cases, this is due to an actual rare projection that there will be more um, emissions in a certain area. So especially uh, in Africa and um, I guess maybe Indonesia a little bit. These areas are also are expected to actually increase their emissions, especially of, um, of SO2 and, o and organic carbon, um, due to just an increase in uh, development and also an increase in biomass burning in the case of OC. Uh, however, this sort of big area right here doesn't really coincide with any emissions increases, as you can imagine. Um, and so what's going on there, we think, is that uh, basically wet deposition is becoming less efficient at removing um, particles, soluble, soluble aerosols like sulfate. Uh, and so that causes um, a longer aerosol lifetime with respect to wet deposition and sort of elevates um, the concentrations. Can you check the vertical distribution? Is it just because the aerosols go above clouds? Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I haven't checked the vertical distribution. I've checked the wet deposition fluxes um, and from, from sulfate, but I haven't checked the vertical distribution. Yeah, because the, the precipitation might increase, but if the aerosols have escaped above clouds, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so in this area, I think the aerosol does, that, sorry, the precipitation does increase over this part of the, the world. So, yeah, what you're saying could be going on. Okay, uh, so the radiative forcing is shown here. This is the total global aerosol radiative forcing. So that's why it's all negative. Um, you can see as, as we approach the year 2000, we're kind of close to where we are today. We have um, this high negative aerosol radiative forcing. And then according to the different projections, it sort of starts to go away, um, heads back towards where it was in pre-industrial times. Uh, and if you take the difference between sort of the end of the century and the be uh, beginning of the 21st century, you can see, depending on which uh, <coughs> scenario you look at, but in general, it's going to be at least a, a one watt per square meter um, increase so in, um, in radiative forcing just due to this declining aerosols. And then again, um, just like we've, I've said a couple times now, it really doesn't seem to matter, I guess, which one of these you pick, at least uh, not to a very great degree. Uh, there is some variation in the mid middle of the century, but they sort of all have the same qualitative um, trend. Okay, and so now we can look at the global climate response um, from these decreasing aerosols. So again, just as a reminder, this is the differences between the aerosol uh, RCP projections, which they're just decreasing as, as expected, and then the fixed emissions. And so this causes an increase uh, in temperature globally of about 0.7 to 1 um, uh, degrees Celsius, as is shown here. Uh, it's one thing that's interesting is I, I mentioned like this cold rebound here, uh, which shows up in the temperature. And for that matter, it also shows up in the cloud droplet radius, the precipitation and the liquid water path as well. Um, so the, the fact that these things are following the, um, even even some of these indirect effect qualities are following the emissions inventories pretty closely, um, or correlated, I guess. Um, so yeah, precipitation, you can see there, is going to increase, of course, due to the decreasing aerosols. Um, liquid water path is the only one of these four that declines with um, decreasing aerosols, of course. And then cloud droplet radius um, is really strongly, uh, probably the, the best case of how closely tied these things this, this is to the aerosol emissions. Um, and I guess one thing to note is that the shading is they're represent, representing the, the ensemble member range. So once you consider the shading, the range of the ensemble members, you can definitely say that um, with a few exceptions, the trends in each different RCP, especially in terms of temperature precipitation, are uh, pretty identical across the board. So what does this look like, again, um, spatially? So here I'm plotting the differences for the end of the century. Um, the same four parameters, temperature, precipitation rate, LWP, and cloud droplet radius. Um, so the temperature increases pretty much everywhere, uh, with some of the biggest increases happening over the Arctic, sort of the polar ampl amplification phenomenon. Uh, but there's also some pretty big increases over sort of China, as you can see, um, you know, two or three Kelvin maybe. And 
also all these most or well pretty much the entire map uh, is statistically significant as indicated by these uh, dotted areas um, precipitation on the other hand is uh, much more noisy and uh, sort of well not many of the, the aerosol driven changes are statistically significant uh, at least the biggest changes aren't and uh, so I mean I guess one thing that might be going on here is just that aerosols uh, aerosol perturbations of course the, the changes aren't really happening the emissions changes of course aren't happening here and here um, but sort of the big climate impacts are and so this is just sort of saying that they're not necessarily co-located and they can have teleconnections to other uh, so changes in one domain can have teleconnections to another um, let's see I do have Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's not a ton of significance. It's probably hard to see the dots on the screen, especially with the broken projector dots. Um, but so yeah, a lot of the bigger changes are not significant. Yeah. Um, so for for liquid water path, uh, you get a really big increase uh, over the Arctic. Uh, which in general, or over the polar regions, I guess, in general, uh, which goes against sort of the, uh, what you'd expect with decreasing aerosols. Um, this is, this could just be due to the temperature increase caused par partially by the aerosols. So it, especially in the North Pole, you have this large temperature increase, um, which could be causing uh, the air to hold more water, hold more moisture, essentially, um, around there. And so that might be why you get this sort of big increase at LWP, whereas in the con around the continental regions where the aerosols are decreasing, it's uh, fairly consistent that the LWP also decreases. And then cloud droplet radius um, differences, these are all um, increasing, of course, because uh, as you sort of take away the aerosols, you take away the smaller anthropogenic particles, um, so <coughs> your cloud droplets become larger. Uh, and so that's pretty consistent across the entire map, I would say. Do you believe that? Why, why would I not? Um, <laughs> um, well, because there's plenty of aerosols over land, and you decrease them by I don't know, 50%, you've still got plenty to make cloud particles. So you could change lots of things over land and have no effect on, on the number of cc. You, you're saturating the CCM over vast parts of the, of the land surface. So it seems kind of odd. Uh, I mean, this is removing all of the anthropogenic and biomass burning aerosols. So, I'm, I don't know. I, I could see that argument, that, like for maybe over the oceans, but for over the land, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe some of this is due to other factors, but this is again just the isolated aerosol um, portion. So I'm not sure I really understand. So you also remove biomass. Biomass burning, yeah. Aerosols. Don't you don't remove it? No. You said to do thousand five. Yeah. So there is yeah. plenty. Yeah. yeah. Ah. But we're saying for the difference, though. Yeah. Um. I think personally, I'd be very skeptical as to whether the way in which aerosols are driving droplet size is is correct, because most observations would suggest that you know, most land areas are pretty much saturated and aerosols don't have a huge effect. They have a big effect once you're in a nice clean place, right? If you're in a clean place and you change it, then it can have an effect. But if you're somewhere that's got hundreds, many hundreds of CCN per CC, it doesn't really have much effect if you, uh, if you change them by 50%. Hmm, okay. Um. And also you increase the uh, the absolute humidity in, uh, in the warming world. So with RCP 8.5, you'll have something like four degrees higher temperature globally. So you'll have plenty more water to come back. Yeah, so I can't exactly, so with this plot, it's sort of, you know, temperature could be driving a lot of these different things. And I definitely- Yeah, but just if you want, you can look at all the more and compare it Right, 
I would, I mean, so this is, this is consistent with another study that sort of did a similar thing, um, where they, you know, did the difference between the aerosols in the 2005, and they also got, you know, sh basically this. So, I mean, I see your point, but it's also been... <laughs> I want to know that your climatology for droplet size was reasonable for all the different climate types before I, I believe it. Yeah. You know, because dynamics is such a big effect. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's something I know a little bit about. That's what I probably want to ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well. Uh, okay. So here. Uh, I'm plotting sort of the fraction of the climate response forced by aerosol decreases. So this is the, the ratio of um, the, the, aeros the aerosol forced um, decreases versus like the, just the total change from aerosols, greenhouse gases, and everything um, to sort of give you an idea of how much aerosols might play a role. Um, and <coughs> Yeah, of course, these, it's a nonlinear situation, so, you know, it's not like, I wouldn't expect these numbers to be, uh, you know, the final answer on aerosols definitely contribute this much to surface temperature or whatever, um, but it's just sort of a rough idea, um, and I think the numbers are a little bigger than a lot of people have uh, expected, especially if you look at temperature over um, East Asia, you can get... 30 to 40 percent of the warming coming from this aerosol decline uh, compared to the total uh, warming from, say, greenhouse gases and everything put together, uh, which is a pretty significant um, amount. And then ac across the world, it's probably, um, you know, most of the world is at least at 10 to 20 percent. So these aren't things that um, should be overlooked, I don't think, when, when discussing sort of climate policy and um, air pollution policy and cleaning up sort of the air pollution problems. Uh, the precipitation change, in, sorry, the precipitation fraction uh, is pretty uh, localized, pretty noisy. It's either sort of entirely contributing or not a factor at all. Um, maybe contributing isn't really the right word, actually, just uh, higher ratio, I guess. Um, the same thing for uh, the water path. And then cloud droplet radius uh, has a pretty large, um, you know, almost everywhere there's a large fraction of the total forcing uh, driven is, is coming from the aerosols. Uh, so I don't know, does that, that doesn't convince you anymore, does it either? You would still say that uh, just because this isn't like additive like that, you can't really. Really is additive. Yeah. So that it's, it's interesting, but you want to have a look at other diagnostics. This is a very sensitive parameter. Yes. Right. Maybe you need more ensemble so numbers. Yeah. Uh, we did a paper where we evaluated the GSGL, the NCA GS model, and we you know, get these parameters. Yeah, okay. Um, so do you guys have prognostic cloud droplet radius in calculation, I guess? Okay. And then, yeah. sir, 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 in the IPCC report, there's, there's always this, this, this estimate of uh, influence or forcing due to aerosols, and it's basically a giant error bar. Mm -hmm. um, and that error bar is, I guess, mostly due to um, uh, differences in all the models that are used. Yeah, Do you know where in this error bar GFDL is? Is it having a very um, strong forcing due to aerosols or something? Yeah, like that? so that's actually um, a pretty good point to bring up. It's sort of a caveat of all this work is that uh, if you look, this is total direct and indirect forcing, and if you look at the present day value, you know, we're somewhere around minus 1.8 watt per square meter. Um, and so the IPCC range for uh, this value at, at, at present day is um, probably like 0.9 to 1.9 or something like that. Uh, so 
the, the GFDL model is very much on the, the higher end, uh, and it's um, they're not. I mean, we're not entirely sure exactly what what's causing it, but it, it appears to be um, sort of a, a, a cloud lifetime effect problem that it, that's causing too much negative forcing. Um, but yeah, that's a good point to, to bring up. Is that a caveat to these plots and to pretty much everything is that. Uh, we are on the high end of the mm -hmm. IPCC range. How exactly do you define this cloud lifetime for the conversion? Uh, so what I what I was looking at was um, well actually, does it, should I say that these are the effective radiative enforcing calculations? So it's the uh, the fixed sea surface temperature calculation. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then also. Yeah, I think the problem is probably with the auto conversion rate, uh, or the auto conversion parameterization, which is um, it's just based on you know one parameter right now in, in the GFDL model, and I've so there's some papers by uh, I forget who that is sort of in science about ten years ago or something that talked about um, improvements in auto conversion parameterization causing. Uh, or problems with auto conversion causing this extra uh, aerosol lifetime effect. So, yeah. and so in general, could you just say it's, it's just setting the aerosol effect back to well, 1900? So basically removing this, this <coughs> is, it, is it like yeah, reversible or something? Is that, is that what's going on? So, and then if you look at the other model that, that estimates 0.9, then you just move, remove the 0.9. Uh, sorry, you're saying, well, so I don't know, I don't think that the, you know, the, the chain, the complexity of the model probably wouldn't just allow you to sort of take this without having the, the historical portion of it. Um, so, I mean, you probably get, you probably get a different looking, actually, there, that's already been done. Drew Schindel had, has a paper that looks at this, and uh, yeah, their their line is probably yeah they don't get greater than one watt per square meter. I don't think it was probably I don't know point eight or something like that at, at most. So it, it definitely varies based on what model you're using. Yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to reconcile point nine with what we describe with the increase in energy in the ocean. is uh, a plot 
that I just made today, actually. Um, this is, I'm looking at the regional climate response in 2100 uh, from the different, um, the four different uh, climate parameters that I showed earlier. And I'm looking at the, the red bars are sort of the total forcing from greenhouse gases, from aerosols, from everything. And then the blue is just from aerosols. And <clears throat> some of the, the point here is just that, uh, I've kind of already made this point, but actually, first of all, the, the different um, x-axis is different regions. So these are regionally broken down as defined here. Um, and it's just showing that the you know, the aerosols are, are going to be a substantial, the decrease in aerosols are going to play a substantial role in future climate. Um, and I don't know if that's fully appreciated, especially for things, if so, if you look at things like temperature and precipitation, which of course are more relevant in the climate impacts world, um, you can see that, so for East Asia, you know, you have about two and a half or so temperature increase just from the aerosols. Uh, and you know, the, the all, all forcing bar is something around six or seven. Uh, and so it, everywhere across across the different regions, it's pretty consistent that it's uh, not an insignificant, a modest, a modest but not insignificant portion of sort of the total climate forcing. Uh, and then I've also shown here some, uh, well, we'll just skip the, we'll skip the refractive radius stuff right for now. We've already sort of talked about that and problematic issues. <coughs> Can you quantify uh, whether it's mostly the indirect effect or the direct effect of does that? Because two degrees from warming from black carbon alone is probably too much. No, it's mostly the indirect effect, at least in the GFTL model. So the sensitivity on that is a really important to get this number right. Yeah, so the, in the GFTL model, um, basically the direct effect of black carbon and the direct effect of sulfate and organic carbon roughly cancel, uh, whether or not that's accurate. Is, that's not uncommon. Yeah. Um, but, and so what ends up driving a lot of the aerosol stuff is indirect effect as a result of that. So, good point. <coughs> All right. Uh, and so sort of my last, uh, my last sort of results slide here is I'm showing now uh, this, the time, the temporal correlations at each location uh, on the, on grid of uh, aerosol depth and different climate parameters. And so, um, you know, I guess we keep talking about this, but I point out that with the, with the, the effect of radius um, is very strongly anti-correlated with the um, emissions changes. And I know we've heard some arguments saying that, that they wouldn't, you wouldn't trust that, but anyway, that's, that's a, a very strong anti-correlation. Um, Precipitation, on the other hand, is rather noisy. Uh, there's some areas where you get a strong anti-correlation, mostly East Asia, um, and yeah, other way. Otherwise, uh, there's not a whole lot else to say. Um, and then, so I've already fo focused a lot on temperature, and so we'll skip that for now. Uh, but then the liquid water path stuff is also pretty strongly uh, correlated. Uh, especially over Europe and Asia. All right, so to summarize sort of everything, um, so I made the point that uh, emission changes dominate climate-driven changes to aerosol concentrations, and I showed that with uh, both AOD and surface PM. Uh, it's, it appears to be of little consequence which RCP is used to evaluate the impact of decreasing aerosols on climate. Uh, this is sort of a shortcoming of the RCPs in that they weren't designed very well for, aeros for air pollution or aerosol related problems like this. Um, and to summarize the global results a little bit, uh, you know, we get, I said a greater than one watt per square meter radiative forcing, uh, you know, up to a degree of warming, two to three regionally, and then, um, you know, sort of modest changes to some of the other things like 3% precipitation increase, 2% LWP, and 5% effective radius. Um, <coughs> Uh, let's see. So, uh, yeah, also that regionally uh, climate impacts from the aerosol decline uh, will be substantial. Uh, they're, especially for things like temperature and precipitation, I think it's not very well recognized right now that, uh, you know, this could be a third 
Uh, I didn't even talk about sort of the other RCPs, but if you look at the other RCPs, the, the aerosol factor and sort of this um, forcing sort of the climate impacts is even larger. Um, yeah, and some of, you know, some of the other RCPs aren't as realistic, so that's understood. But um, even for RCP 8.5, we see that uh, the climate impacts are, uh, are important from, from the aerosol decline. And then sort of a policy point is that uh, due to um, the aerosol decreases, there may be uh, necessary more aggressive greenhouse gas mitigation policies to reach desired climate targets. So if you, especially for certain regions, so if you want to talk about avoiding, you know, a certain threshold of warming, um, there has to be sort of a discussion of uh, targeting the right sources of air pollution so as to avoid the uh, unmasking of this warming that I've been talking about. And so uh, that's it, and thanks for listening.